I am very happy to be back here in the Boston area and very happy to meet several old friends and some new ones too. What I share in these meetings is actually very simple and can be said in a very few words. The truth that I share with you is that all the answers to all our questions are within our own self. If we could look within our own self and see the treasure house of information, of experience, of life itself, we would have to go nowhere else to find answers. This is my message. Go within and you'll get all the answers, everything you want to know, everything you want to experience. Period. I could at this stage end the lecture and go home. But the human mind doesn't accept simple answers. The human mind wants an acceptable answer because it has installed itself on a pedestal. The human mind has put so much emphasis on sitting on a high pedestal that unless something matches the prestige that we want to give to our minds, we do not accept it. A very simple answer is too simple for us, so we reject it. Or we say, fine, so far so good, but now let's get to something real, something matching our own intellect, our own mind. This business of trying to match our experience to our own pedestal that we have set up has caused most of our problems in life because we have never been able to match life's experience with our own pedestal which we have set up. We do it in a strange garb of self-esteem that we are trying to build up self-esteem. We are encouraging other people to build up self-esteem. Unless you have self-esteem, unless you can put yourself in a position where you can appreciate yourself, you will go into depression, you will be trampled upon, you will not be able to live life, everybody will take advantage of you, they will exploit you, choke you, so you must build up self-esteem. In that process of building up our self-esteem, we are placing ourselves and an image of ourselves on a pedestal which doesn't belong to us. <coughs> also, nobody else accepts it. We put ourselves on a pedestal hoping that everybody else can see it. Nobody else sees it. We blow our own trumpets and people don't take it seriously. And we are disappointed. We are disappointed with people. They do not know what we are. They don't see where we belong. And they are so simple. They are so stupid. We use all kinds of adjectives for people because they do not match up with our own pedestal we have built in the name of self-esteem. Actually, self-esteem is not bad. If you could attain an element of respect and esteem for your own self, nothing like it. The trouble is we don't know who we are, what the self is. If we knew what the self is, we would never have a problem. We would not have to build anything. Knowledge of oneself gives more self-esteem than any exercise in putting up on a pedestal an ego that is already bloated with our own idea of who we are. I was surprised to see in an experiment I conducted many years ago that when people look into the mirror to see what they look like, that's the only way they can see what they look like. They don't believe what people tell. If somebody says you are very good looking, say no, 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 you are not telling the truth. They just try to praise me. If somebody says you are so ugly, no, that person is not. Nobody is telling the truth. So the mirror must tell the truth. So we stand in front of the mirror and we look at ourselves. We look at the most favorable angle. Still, there is something in our head saying, maybe that is not what people are seeing. Indeed, they are not seeing that what you are seeing. Even if there is no mirror, what you are seeing of yourself is not what people are seeing. Nor are you what you are seeing in the mirror. That is the image you are putting on a pedestal. You want to look like that. You want to be seen by people like that. But you are not that. And in this great game of appearances, of trying to look in a certain way, we are creating an idea of self-esteem not based upon the self at all, but upon a fake image of what the self ought to be like. During one of the sessions of EST training that I received, I was very impressed by 
one single statement in that, what is, is the truth. What ought to be is a fallacy. What ought to be is the mind's imagination. What is, is God's creation. We are constantly spending our time on what we ought to be, not what we are. We are trying to build an image of ourselves, which is not the one we came with, but what our minds and our egos suggest we should be like. This business of constantly trying to be somebody other than we are and not having the means or the access to find out who we really are is creating all the problems that we face in life. Now, I am not talking of one single problem. Series of problems come up from this. Our misunderstandings with people, our inability to control our temper and anger, our inability to control our desires, our inability to understand karma, our rationalization of all the mishappenings that are taking place, all these are arising from not knowing who we are. If we just look at ourselves plain and simple as we are and see the truth of who we are, we will have none of these problems. Now, why should it be difficult to know who we are without having to go to a mirror? We look into the looking glass, into the mirror, that only shows our face. It does not show the thoughts that are going on when we are looking at the mirror. Now, how do I look? Is my hair in the right place? Is my dress in the right place? Have I got the right complexion? Do I need more makeup? Do I need less makeup? Do I need this or that? Why do we, those thoughts that are going in our head are not going on on the mirror. They, those thoughts are emanating from the self, which are not emanating, not reflected in the mirror. Why can't we sometimes stop and see who is thinking? Why are we thinking like that? Where are we thinking from? Where are we in the first place? Is that the self that is speaking? Is it somebody else's voice that is suggesting things to us? Is it our own self? Those who have done this little introspection of looking back into themselves, who is thinking? They have come up with startling discoveries. One of the most startling discoveries a student of introspection into the self finds in the course of the seeking is that these questions are not being asked by the self. It's amazing. When I share with people that what you think is not your thought, they say, whose thought is it? There's nobody else there. But then experience teaches us there is somebody else who quarrels with us, argues with us, pulls us, pulls the threads of conscience, creates guilt in us, tells us what is right and wrong. There's something going on. Looks like there's more than one personality. Looks like there is one who says, do it. They say, no, no, don't. Looks like there is more than one personality that contributes to thinking in our head. Who is that other that thinks like this? Since we don't know any other, we think that must be the self. The truth is that is not the self. The truth is that all these thoughts in our heads, which create our image, <clears throat> our fake image of who we are, which give us the support of what we should look like when dealing with the world, that is not ourselves. That is our mind. That startles people. Our mind? Is our mind separate from us? Is the mind not the self? Does the self not think? So when these Eastern mystics first propounded this explanation of what is happening in our heads, that the self does not think at all, that the self uses the mechanism of the mind, the mental apparatus is a mechanism the self uses in order to think. It was very difficult for the Western world to understand what they were saying. It was so difficult for them to understand that the mind is an instrument and a computer, a machine that is being used by the self to create thoughts. They said, then what is self? Aren't those thoughts the self? I said, no, thought is a function. Thought takes place in time. Thought takes duration. Even a single thought, you go through a thought. How can it be the self? The self is the one that uses the mind for thought. But self is not the thought. Then what is thought? And what is self? Thought is a utilization of the mental process. And self is the consciousness that can make that use. If we are unconscious, we cannot use our mind. When we are conscious, we can use our minds. If we are conscious and don't use our minds, we are still there. When we use our minds, we are still there. The self is 
consciousness per se. Self is the ability to be conscious, the ability to be aware whether you use your mind or not. Of course, if you are placing the self in a time frame and you have a mechanism to think, you will think. We as conscious human beings think all the time. Have you ever noticed that we never stop thinking? I have suggested sometimes to people, and the first time somebody took me seriously was in this very Massachusetts area in the university at Harvard, who said, I am going to try how to stop thinking. And that was a yogi who actually thought he had mastered the art of how to stop thinking. Because I agreed with him, if one can stop thinking and is still conscious, one would find out what the self is and not confuse it with thoughts. He practiced through a yogic exercise in the Boston Yoga Center of the early 60s. The art of stilling the mind, quietening the mind, so the mind doesn't think at all. He practiced it to perfection according to his own idea of what perfection was. And then he came and informed me that he had at last understood how one can stop thinking and thereby know what consciousness is. And I was very happy to find at least one person in the West who could do it because none could do it in the East. They tried and they failed. And as I was being introduced, I was trying to see the East and West and where they are common and where they are different and where the language is different and the thing, truth is the same. So I was very fascinated by that. So he came over to my apartment in Cambridge and he said, Ishwar, I have found a very simple method. It's a yogic skill in which you can so control your mind that your mind becomes still and stops thinking and you are in utter bliss. I said, let's have it experiment right now. I am not interested about the bliss part right now. I am interested in a state of consciousness in which one does not think. And let's set an experiment with and clock it so that we know how long one does not think. And let's make it a short period. He offered to stop thinking for about an hour to give me time to study what happens when one is not thinking. I cut down the time to one minute. I said, if one can do it for one minute, I'm sure one can do it for an hour. So why waste an hour to test out? 60 seconds was enough. So we set the time, 9 o'clock by our watches. At 9 o'clock, I was looking at my watch and I said, I'll give you a signal like this, exactly like this. And I'll keep my eye on the watch. You keep on doing your thing, which is to get into a state where you don't think. One minute past nine, I'll give the second signal. Exactly like this. Between these two claps, there should be no thoughts. He agreed. That's easy. He said, but before you give a clap, give me time to get into my asana and to my posture. Of course, I said, you can take all your time. He didn't take very long. In a few minutes, he was in a special posture. And looking like a real good yogi, very impressive, he sat there and all I knew was with his closed eyes he was there and I was watching my time and gave the two signals to commence cessation of thinking and to commence thinking again. After that, I questioned him whether he succeeded. He said yes. As usual, he succeeded. He didn't think about it at all, about anything. I said, all right, let's question ourselves as to what happened because we are analyzing what happens to consciousness, a person who is awake, a person who hasn't gone into a trance, hasn't gone into sleep and is still awake and sitting in front of me and is not thinking. What is happening to consciousness? Some experience must be going on. Let's see what happened. So I asked him that before you started this exercise, you must have uh, prepared yourself to listen to my clap because that was the signal to stop thinking. Did you prepare yourself with thoughts that when I will hear this sound, that's the time to stop thinking? He said, yes, he did. So I said, when you heard this sound, what happened? What happened? I said, it is not a theoretical exercise. We are now trying to recall actual memory of what happened after you heard the sound, recall what happened in your head. And he was able to recall. He said, as soon as I heard this, I said to myself, this is the time to stop thinking. I said, that was a thought. 
to say this in your head, this is the time to stop thinking, is a thought. He said, that is true. But it was a very short thought. Just took a few seconds, maybe two or three seconds. I said, exclude those seconds. I don't care if the experiment wasn't 60 seconds. Let us say it was 57 seconds. The first three seconds are over. The rest 57 seconds of no thought is still there. What happened then? Did you know that I will give a clap again for you to start thinking again? He said, yes, I did. How did you know it? Because if after saying this is the time to stop thinking, you had stopped thinking, you would never think again. You would still be in the same state. What prepared you to anticipate a second signal on which you will start thinking? Recall, remember, personally, it just happened 10 minutes ago. What happened? And he was able to recall. Oh, yes. Now I recall. After I said, now is the time to stop thinking, I also said, and I will not think till he claps again. So that's another thought. Maybe a few more seconds. I said, then after that, did you not keep on anticipating? To cut a long story short, in 15 minutes conversation, he held up, after recalling everything that happened in the head, he held his head like this and said, oh my God, I thought more in these 60 seconds than ever before. This experience shows that even when we feel that we have been able to still our mind and there are no thoughts, we are a constant commentator upon our own state. We constantly comment. Just now mention was made of my association with His Holiness Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama, when he came to Dharamsala, he was under training by two tutors in the art of meditation. And although he was Dalai, he was accepted as a god king. He was a spiritual leader and temporal leader of the Tibetan Buddhists. He, from childhood, had been trained by two experts in meditation. He was doing eight hours of meditation a day. And what we compared as comparison of notes was what happens to the mind and its thinking. And he found out something that many others had not found out, that the mind never stops thinking. When we feel it has stopped thinking in one channel, it jumps to another and starts thinking there. For example, in meditation, we often use repetition of words as a means of controlling the thinking of the mind. We start using a mantra, we start repeating something, so that by constantly repeating it, the mind will be absorbed in those words and will not think. This is very common. In so many disciplines, we use the repetition of words as a means to control the thinking of the mind. The Dalai Lama was able to find out when we are actually saying whatever our, med uh, whatever our mantra is, supposing it is A, B, C, D, while the mind is saying A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, repeating this, there is some part of the mind also saying, aren't you doing it too fast? When are you going to stop? How long is this exercise? Oh, you forgot something at home. This is going on at the same time while we are repeating A, B, C, D. And A, B, C, D is being repeated in a coarser, more audible voice. And these comments are coming in a finer voice on top of it. And he found that is also the same mind using a different channel. Many yogis in India who are perturbed by this have said that mind can take three, four, five channels. The Dalai Lama was the first yogi I met who was able to personally watch that when the mind comments upon each other, controlling one level, another jumps up to start thinking, it can go up to eight channels. And he personally experienced eight channels of voices which could be heard. And they were all mind and none was the self. So you can imagine that when we in a very simplistic way, think that because we are thinking, because these words are coming in our head, because we are sharing these words with others, that expresses who we are. And that self, which we are expressing through thoughts, ought to be built up in a pedestal. We run into all the difficulties. We are as far away from knowing ourselves as we were in knowing a stranger. We are strangers in our own body. We have reached a point when we cannot understand that we are talking to a machine and forgetting who is using the machine. And thereby we become a stranger. The machine talks to the machine within the head and we think that we have found out the self. That there is a basic consciousness, a basic awareness which must exist in order for thinking to take place, for the mind to be utilized. We forget. 
just like seeing. Let us say seeing. You see with the eyes. You see something. You see that blue chair there. I was just sitting on that blue chair. And I look at the blue chair. And I say, I am seeing the blue chair. If I constantly see the blue chair, then the blue chair becomes my vision. And I say, vision means blue chair. That's not true. It just happened to be one experience of vision. One experience of seeing was the blue chair. It does not mean blue chair alone means seeing. But that's precisely the mistake we are making, that consciousness is thinking, because we think with consciousness. That's not true. Consciousness does not become thinking merely because we use it for thinking. Consciousness does many things which thinking can never do. For example, it can have intuition, a sudden knowledge, a sudden flush of knowing something without thought. No thought before that, no thought after that, and we know it. That hunch that comes also comes in consciousness, and there is no thought involved. Is that not part of the self? Take another example, the feeling of love for somebody. We suddenly get that experience of love. We haven't had any time to think of it. We start thinking, what's happened? We start thinking, why? Why am I attracted to this person? Why is this happening? These are thoughts. The whys, the questions are thoughts. But the experience of love is not thought. That feeling of identification when one can forget oneself and be so absorbed in consciousness with the beloved is not thought. And yet it is a conscious experience. And we have it. Don't we realize that consciousness is having experiences within ourselves which don't require thinking? And what is the quality of these experiences like intuition and love and devotion and faith? What is the quality of these experiences? The quality of these experiences is that they do not lead to doubt as they occur. When those experiences take place, we are in a state of certainty. But when we start thinking about these, we are in a state of doubt. Here is the mind which by its very process of thinking creates doubt. And in addition to doubt, creates fear. I have not come across a single person who did not have doubt and fear through thinking. If somebody comes up and says, I am a macho guy, I never get frightened. I will tell him, sit down and think twice again. Give him another half an hour. It is a question of time. When after a while he says, what is he, why is he doing this? What is he doing? I am now doubtful what is going on. Thinking has generated doubt. Has lack of thinking ever generated doubt? No. But when we think, we can create doubt for ourselves and for everybody else around us. We can create doubt and fear in the whole world. If we rely so excessively on this image of ourselves, the mental self, the egoistic self, the self-esteem based upon our own image of who we are mentally, if we live in this world with that, we are generators of doubt and fear. On the other hand, if we live in the world with our hunch, our gut knowledge, our heart, our feelings, our spontaneity, we are the creator of love and peace throughout the world. It is so simple. You see people in every community, you see people in every country around whom there is love and peace. They don't even speak. They don't even say anything. You go and be with them and you feel at peace with yourself and with them and you say, what an atmosphere. What is in the atmosphere? It's the same air that we breathe. But around those people, they are not pulling us into thoughts. They are pulling us into our own basic intuition, our own self. The self is that consciousness that does not require thinking. And thinking takes us away from it. To overcome fear and doubt, what is required is to live with the self. The self that does not require thinking. The self that is based upon gut knowledge, sudden, immediate, permanent knowledge, something that you can generate through love, through identification, through oneness. That is the self. If we know the self, our esteem goes up automatically. That is true self-esteem. Somebody says, we should build self-esteem for the sake of living in this world. I agree. But the self-esteem should be based upon the real self, not the mask that we wear, which we call the self, which is the mind. If we wore only one mask, it would be easy to take it off. Supposing I want to look different. I like 
my friend Clarence. He comes with me. His dark skin, black, big. And I don't look like him coming from Asia, browner color, not so white. And in Chicago area, south side, nobody respects anybody unless you're big and black. And I supposing buy a mask. And I put that mask on me. And I say, I look like Clarence now. So I go about, I look in the mirror, I look black because I put on that mask. And I take a big mask and look fat. And then, on top of that, I come out, I come out to New England. And I, and I find that people don't like that color. People are still in the old style of accepting that the, the whites are a superior race. And I say, what did I do? I am a black Clarence and I've come into the wrong place. I should have taken my mask off. But supposing instead of taking the mask off, I buy another mask, a white one, put on top of that and say, now I am inwardly black, but outwardly I'm white. I'm using two masks. And if these don't fit in, I put on a third one. If I keep on covering up myself with masks, I lose my own identity. I forget who it is who is wearing the mask. That's our state here. That we have so lost our own self that we are using these masks. Mask of this physical body, that's the self. If not that, then my intentions, my perceptions, what I can see is myself. Second mask. If that is not enough, all right, my thoughts, I think high. The thoughts are my mask. We have put upon ourselves these three masks and totally forgotten who we are. The mask of the physical body, which we consider is our self. The mask of our senses, which we think is our self. The mask of our thoughts, which we think is our self. And we don't know who the self is. And by wearing more than one mask, we get so confused. If somebody says, these are masks and you are not the truth, you are inside. You say, okay, which one is me? Peel off one, maybe this one. And we are busy peeling one mask and another and never reaching the self. We are busy trying to see, are my sensory perceptions the real thing? Is my astral body, the body that can go out of this, the body that can fly out? Is my imaginative body more real than this? Is my causal body, is my ethereal body more real? We forget none of them is real. These are bodies. And we want to identify ourselves with one or the other. We are not content with just arguing to ourselves while we are here. We argue even beyond death. After death, we have an experience. Like a spirit, we fly. And how do we fly? With another body, which is as unreal, as much of a mask as this one. That's not the self. How can a body be the self? However ethereal it might be. One very simple Mahatma, simple sage, made a short statement which has stuck to me. I've never been able to forget it. He said, remember, what is mine cannot be me. Very simple, but very truthful. He said, if you say, this is my hand, remember, you can never be the hand. If you were the hand, you wouldn't say, this is my hand. When you say, this is my hand, you are claiming this to be yours, but you are who claims it and not the hand. When you say, this is my body, you cannot be the body. You, it is your body. That's why you claim it. How can the body be you? When you say, this is my mind, you cannot be the mind. If you say, this is my soul, you cannot be the soul. Whatever you claim, you are the claimant, not what you claim. It struck me as such a great truth. And I discovered all these years, I was considering these various things I claimed to be the self. How could that be the self? When I started moving backwards, if the body is not the self, the one sitting inside the body must be the self. Who is sitting inside the body that is saying, this is my body? Some consciousness that is speaking from within. That some ethereal form of me that is inhabiting this body must be the self. That ethereal form is also just another body, another mind, another soul. Piercing these different masks and covers upon myself, I discovered that even saying, I am the individuated self, is not me. Because the individuated self is a claim being made by that which is not individuated. And this introspection alone, this meditation alone, cut me a strange conclusion that consciousness could not be an individuated phenomenon. That the self could not be split into pieces. That we are not so many selves. 
that there could be only one self which claims individuation, claims mental separation, claims being different bodies, and therefore we have become the many. And the one that claims all this could never be one, could be total, could be just it. And it occurred to me that when all the experiences of life come to us because we are aware of them and there is no other source of experience, this awareness must be a very strong thing. Has anybody ever seen a world without being conscious of it? Nobody. When we say the world is very large, we say it's very large because we are conscious it is very large. When we say the world is now, that's the edge of the world, that is what we experience in consciousness. What we are totally unconscious of, we never speak of as creation. We never speak of as existence. Our whole experience of existence is based upon what we are aware of. So awareness or consciousness limits the creation of the whole universe. This consciousness must be something so deep, so universal, that one should study what this consciousness is to get an answer to what the self could be. When one studies consciousness, one comes to a strange conclusion that this consciousness itself is creating all that it has become conscious of. I saw this cup of water and I tasted it. Tastes good with a lime in it. This water, this experience of the water is what I am conscious of. If I was not conscious of, there would be no cup, there would be no water, there would be no experience. That the consciousness of things are making things was a new, new kind of statement. I had a very hard time in the 60s sharing with people that when you see a thing, is the thing there because you see it or are you seeing it because it's there? Question was very simple. What is the cause? What is the effect? You see a chair. Is the chair there because you are seeing it or you are seeing it because it is there? The answer is whatever comes first must be the truth. If chair is placed there, then I see it. Then chair must be the cause. So when we look at the chair, somebody takes the chair away, puts another one, and then we see the second one, we believe that the chair was there and therefore we saw it. Therefore, seeing is an effect and the chair is the cause. What about in a dream? We go to sleep and we see the chair. Is the chair being created because we are dreaming or the chair is put there, therefore we dream of the chair. When we wake up, we find we don't need any chairs to dream about chairs that the chairs we see in a dream are being created from consciousness and they look like they are there already. The same thing can happen in a dream. A person comes up and says, I'll remove this chair and put another one. This is not that old chair you made out of a dream. It's real because I changed it. And then you wake up and you found that that person who placed the chair was also a dream. How could you check one part of the dream with another part of the dream and say this was real? A mistake we are making here all the time. A mistake we are making in this wakeful physical life of thinking because we are experiencing one thing and it leads to our sensory experience of that thing. The thing must be the cause. The truth is when we see the chair, the seeing of the chair and the chair being there are simultaneous. None is the cause and none the effect. It's a simultaneous thing. It's impossible to say which is first, which is second. In truth, the same thing happens in a dream. That seeing a chair is dreaming of the chair at the same time. You create the chair when you see it. And you don't create first and then see it. Nor do you put the chair there, then see it. They are simultaneous at the same time. Similarly, in this physical world, these experiences which are happening, that consciousness becomes conscious of a world. Does consciousness create the world? Or the world is created and then we become conscious? The mystics have answered that there is no real way to find out. They are both happening at the same time. If there is a way to find out, a cross check on this, it could be that if you could have a higher awakening, just like you awaken from a dream, you know at once that you created the chair. If you could have a higher awakening from this physical level, you could find out if you were creating the world or the world was creating you. And they taught simple methods of possible higher awakening, higher levels of consciousness in which we could have an awakened state and see what we were experiencing physically was there or not. And to their amazement, they found that in a higher awakened state, this state becomes like a dream. Therefore, all this world that we see is a product of consciousness. So consciousness is not merely the self 
consciousness is the generator of all the experience of the self. It is the creator of the entire universe. Such a powerful consciousness, which is the real self. If one identifies with that consciousness, one cannot expect any higher esteem than that. Just to be able to know this fact, what consciousness is. And that consciousness is creating what one is experiencing. I said one is experiencing. Which one? Five people sit together and they say, well, we know there is only one creator. But how come all five of us are looking at this world and seeing it? Which one of us is the creator? There was a movie I saw once. Uh, what is the name of that movie, Clarence? In which a person, everything is destroyed. And only one person survives. Huh? Quiet earth. Only one person survives. And he finds that his whole experience is based upon his being alive. He's the creator. But being a creator, he is lonely. There's nobody else. So he creates two more people or three more, five. Ultimately, number of people come up. And he challenges them that you are not the creator. They say, of course, how are you the creator? We are all the same. And they blow up the place and one again survives in another, another earth or other. Say, who is dreaming? Now, are all five dreaming? No, only one is dreaming. The rest are part of the dream. Have you ever had a dream with somebody that you both got into the same dream, except in a movie? Otherwise, one would know that in a dream, the one who wakes up and finds out it was a dream was the only one who was dreaming. You'll be surprised that when you go into a dream, you take a dream body and you are in, inside that body in the dream and that is the dreamer. You have never dreamt in a dream from another body. Have you noticed that? Every time in every dream you have ever had in your life, you are dreaming as the dreamer and in the dream taking on a body which is not the real body, it's a dream body, but the self that is dreaming is in one of those bodies which is considered the self of that body in the dream. When you wake up, you wake up from that body and say, I was having a dream. Supposing you dream that you are a cat. I used to call, uh, give this example as a bird. Uh, they say cats are the most popular pets in this country. So I changed the example. <laughs> Supposing you dream you are a cat and the excellent fur and color and you look in the mirror and beautiful cat and you're jumping around all over saying meow, meow, whatever the cats say, cat language and you're dreaming that you are a cat and then you jump around and then you suddenly look out of the window and fall down from the window and when you get hurt on the street below, when you hurt yourself, you wake up and you wake up and find you are not a cat at all and then you tell your friends, I had a strange dream. I dreamt I was a cat and I fell out of a window and hurt myself. The friends can say, don't talk stupid. You're not a cat. You should not say, I was a cat. Say, you dreamt of a cat that fell out of the window. But that was not the dream. You didn't dream seeing a cat fall out of the window. You dreamt you fell out of the window and you were a cat. The question is, how come that you were inside that cat in the dream to be able to get up and say, I was the cat, I was not seeing a cat. Any form that you take, even in a dream, or in wakeful state, or in an astral form, or causal form, or spiritual form, or soul form, that form does not change the self, nor does it change the location of the self. That self continues to be within and inside of that form. I am not talking of a dream only. I am talking of all spiritual experiences anybody has ever had. People have said we have had out-of-body experience. We flew into the sky. We were so light, we left this body behind. In near-death experiences you find. In another light body, we were flying. Where were you? Inside the light body. The light body was not you. The question is the form has never been you, but you have always been inside the form. That's a great truth to remember. If you look at all historically known experiences of where one has experienced the self, irrespective of form, if you became a cloud tomorrow with no relationship of the forms of any living thing that you know of, floating like a cloud, and you come back into the human body and say, I floated like a cloud. If while as a cloud you knew, wanted to know where the self is, it would be inside the cloud, not outside. If you become a human being, you want to know where the self is inside this human body, not outside. We have never experienced the self 
in any form whatsoever except by sitting in the middle inside of that form. That is why even in this human body, if we want to find where is consciousness operating from, it has to be operating from inside this form, not outside. 